last time, what did we do? So um, last time we basically like kind of finished off our LQG story um, and and basically did the um, kind of the Kalman filter right all the way through and then kind of showed hooking that together with LQR and did, did a little example codes online. You should check it out. Uh, lots of good stuff in there. Um, and so I think that that kind of, I think roughly concludes our tour of classical optimal control and like a bunch of stuff you guys should check out. Um, so the next couple of lectures are going to be kind of case studies. Uh, so today we're going to do the rocket soft landing, which is awesome. Um, we're going to do one on legged robot stuff and kind of how the quadrupeds work, like kind of the standard control stack on like the MIT Cheetah, which has inspired most of the stuff that's around now. Um, and then we're going to do one on autonomous driving, talk about kind of the MPC stack that's on most of those cars and stuff like that. Um, and I think, and then, yeah, I think we'll do, we'll do like an RL lecture. It's somewhere in there. And I think there was threat of like doing some kind of like practical tips and tricks kind of thing about more, more, a little bit more in, into the numerical side of this and like sort of street fighting skills about how to implement these things and things to watch out for tips and tricks kind of stuff. So we might do that. I don't know. I'm actually open. I think we have one lecture slot that's kind of a little open at this point. So um, I'm open to suggestions. If people have things they want to dig into, um, hit me up. I'm actually, I think we can do like probably do some kind of RL lecture, um, some kind of maybe this, this tips and tricks thing. Um, we could do another case study thing of something cool. Um, there's lots of options, I guess. It's, uh, I might, maybe I'll present an option and do a poll. Um, but today we're going to kind of get into the case study stuff and, um, talk about rocket, if I can spell, which is always, uh, a challenge. We're going to do the rocket soft landing problem, which is awesome. So essentially what we're going to do today, we're going to talk a little bit about like kind of the full stack and the backstory of this stuff, but we're essentially going to cover the the main result from this paper, which is a modern classic that I highly recommend checking out. This is uh, Bechet Achikmache, who's now a professor at University of Washington, uh, John Carson, who's still at NASA, and Lars Blackmore, who all these guys were at JPL when this paper came out. This paper's from uh, 2013, so it's like a 10-year-old paper. But basically, this paper is the like, um, kind of has this seminal result of figuring out a convex formulation, as in convex MPC, for the rocket soft landing problem. So like how to land a how to land a rocket. Um, Betchett is a professor at University of Washington now. Uh, John Carson is still at NASA. Lars Blackmore uh, is now kind of the lead uh, GNC guy at SpaceX. Uh, so all the SpaceX, basically uh, the, the first two guys are kind of, uh, Betchett actually still does a lot of work for NASA and his lab does a ton of MPC stuff, but um, He's worked, he and John have worked a lot on the, the Mars landing stuff for NASA. So they do this stuff to land on Mars. And then uh, obviously Lars Blackmore, SpaceX, it's all the SpaceX rocket landing stuff. Um, so this paper kind of was the kernel of all of that, that like now when you see SpaceX landing Starship and all this crazy stuff, that's Lars Blackmore. And um, all the NASA, you know, Mars landing sky crane stuff is also based on this. So this is kind of where it all came from. So we're going to go through kind of the, the, the kind of kernel ideas from this paper today. Like so I'll walk you through some of the math. Which is pretty cool, and then just to get everyone really psyched up. We're gonna watch some some videos because because it's awesome. Um, so this first one, this is obviously SpaceX. This is um, an old Starship video, not the most. This is the last one before the one that blew up very recently because that one didn't actually land. Sad. So this one's like a uh, one that they actually landed, but obviously you guys have seen this a million times now, right? Um, and they land these things on barges out in the ocean. It's pretty bonkers, like how how good this stuff is. Um, and it's uh, essentially the stuff that we're going to walk through today and and show you uh, on the paper. Uh, yeah, Just, you know, egregious YouTube videos. This one's pretty short though. Um, so this is lifting off from the pad, flying flying down uh, down range a little bit, and then flipping around and landing on the pad. Pretty, pretty awesome. And the videos of them doing this from orbit are wild. Like how fast it happens is nuts. Like you you see it's in space and then like falling through the atmosphere and landing is all, all happens in like a, a couple minutes. Like, and you I see it all. So anyway, that stuff is pretty cool. Um, and then the other stuff here that's very cool 
um, is Mars. So this is Mars 2020, the last uh, the last one that landed. And this is kind of the uh, like animation artist rendition of what's going on. Um, so this is right now falling uh, parachute. Um, and the part that we're going to talk about today is this power descent phase. So floating down on parachute, at some point they kick off the uh, the back shell and then turn on the prop system. Oh no, this is the real video. Sorry, I meant to show you the animation first. But this, so this is the sky crane, which is the thing in the top left there, and it's uh, it's basically hovering over the ground right now, and they're uh, lowering down the rover on this crane thing, and then as soon as the rover touches down, they've confirmed touchdown. They cut the cables, and then the sky crane flies away, and they basically deliberately crash it a few hundred meters away so they can guarantee that. Um, it's not gonna hit the rover. Um, one of my good like undergrad buddies is in that. Like he's uh, one of the like EDL guys for. And then yeah, so I meant to show this one first actually. So this is the animation. This kind of shows you the phases. This is where uh, the vehicle hits the upper atmosphere of Mars. This is kind of the this is the entry phase. So this is ballistic entry. It's basically just a fireball. Um, we've actually worked on this in in our lab entry guidance. So steering it as it's in fireball mode. Um, it turns out the accuracy of that is not very good. Like your state knowledge is pretty bad. Uh, it's about a kilometer of error when you hit the atmosphere. And then when you're in fireball mode, your sensors don't work. Uh, it's ionospheric blackout. So you're just doing dead reckoning with the IMU. And your error ellipse when you uh, end up, you know, right here where you kick the parachute out, your position uncertainty versus where you maybe want to land is about 10 kilometers. Um, so now you float down a little bit on the parachute. Uh, they can, they're going to blow the back shell off. And then they start to look down with cameras. They do terrain relative navigation. That stuff, by the way, the vision stuff for this was developed at CMU, uh, which is kind of awesome. So at this point, right, they blow the back shell off. The camera's going to look down and try to map up, uh, like match up with maps. Um, and they're not actually doing navigation per se. They're basically just trying to steer around boulders and not land on a boulder. Uh, sky crane. So this is the power descent phase. This is the part we're going to talk about today. Um, so this thing is going and finding a nice smooth landing spot where there are no big boulders that it uh, you know, doesn't want to touch down on top of. Um, and then pretty soon, once it found a good spot, it's going to hover and the, the crane thing is going to lower the rover down. And then it does this maneuver where it basically goes and flies away several hundred meters and crashes itself into the ground to make sure it doesn't get in the way of the rover, basically. So that's the, so yeah, there's there's kind of this entry guidance phase, which um, our lab has done some work on. Uh, then like once you, then parachute, and then, you know, basically this terrain relative navigation part. The terrain relative navigation part is actually really cool. Um, so what that has enabled is, so the errors on these things are like 10 kilometers plus. Uh, you can't hit it, you know, there's the main reason for that, by the way, is there's no GPS. So your uncertainties are huge. Uh, so. Um, previously, you, they could only land in places that were like big, wide open plains because they you really couldn't pinpoint land. And there's just concern you're going to land on some bad, steep thing. So uh, the TRN stuff now, they still have this like 10 kilometer ish error, uh, but they can at least look with the, the vision system and steer around anything really bad and find it like a locally nice landing spot. OK, cool. So that's that's awesome. Yeah. Are they steering with the parachute? No, no, no. The parachute's kind of a passive thing. So they can't, there's some amount of steering during the ballistic phase. So the way that works, it's called bank angle guidance. Um, it's from Apollo. It's pretty terrible. And we've worked on trying to like make this better in various ways. Essentially what happens, the capsule has the center of mass offset from the center of pressure a little bit. So it basically leans back, right? And there's some angle of attack that's more or less fixed, right? It's based on just the, the mass offset from where the way it's built. Um, so that that means it now has a lift vector and a, a drag vector, and there's some amount of lift that it generates. And you kind of basically just steer yaw the capsule, or it's bank is the way, based on their quarter frame, but you bank the capsule around and you can move that lift vector around. So you can do a couple of different things that way. You can actually steer cross track. And if they need to, basically, if they're going long or short, what they basically do, if you're going too long and you want to shorten up, you zigzag a bunch. Yeah, that's called bank angle guidance. There's literally, this was invented for Apollo and they still run the same control laws from the sixties on this guy now. So we've done a, we had a project for a few years. Um, it was actually the first grant I got on trying to like modernize these bank angle guidance methods. So we did some like MPC stuff. Um, the other big thing they're trying to do now is uh, do both bank and angle of attack modulation. So basically you can imagine a few different ways you might 
change the angle of attack as well. Simplest way being like a linear actuator with a mass on it, so you can move the CG around. So it turns out having two DOF control where you have bank and angle of attack really, really dramatically improves like the, the error uh, accuracy that you can get to. The biggest thing there, like the uncertainties when you hit the atmosphere are like a kilometer because all your navigation is coming from Earth, from, from DSN, and there's no GPS. So uh, it's kind of hard. And then, yeah, when you're in fireball mode, it's totally dead reckoning. It's just whatever your last known state estimate is, you're just blind and you're just integrating the IMU the whole way down. So in the terrain that it, what if you're no longer ballistic, are you on the yeah, yeah, so no, parachute thing, that's, at that point, they they start acquiring uh, features and they with the vision system and they start localizing, but they're not doing any control yet. It's just floating down. And then when they hit some altitude, they cut the parachute and then turn on the engines. And then they're sort of flying and, and you know, the other thing to mention about that is it is completely autonomous because the light time delay, the time it takes the radio signal to get from Mars back to Earth is minutes. So literally by the time you get that video feed, it's already happened, which is wild. So it and like, you know, it's it's kind of insane how good that has to be, right? It has to work. It's this like insane billion dollar thing. Um, and there's no recourse. Like you can't change anything, you can't fix anything, you can't do anything, right? It's it's all just like automated. So super badass, super cool. All right. Any other questions about this? I'm super into this stuff. I love this stuff. Yeah. It's how they localize the areas where it lands before it lands. Before it, so when it's in the air? Yeah. That that so it's all vision. All vision. Yeah. yeah. So they have a um this is called train relative navigation. The all the people at JPL who do this are CMU grads, and the original work was done here, which is kind of awesome. And basically what they're doing is um, there's lots of you know maps and and uh, satellite imagery. So they are matching up known features from the camera system with maps. They have a map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually have very good satellite imagery of all of Mars from orbiters. So there's actually really good maps and then fairly good, you know, satellite imagery data for this kind of stuff. So they kind of pre, you know, design all this stuff and they're using pretty classical machine vision to just do feature matching. Um, yeah. Yeah. How long could that lander have powered, like, to find a good spot? Like I don't know what the fuel margin is on it. Uh, these are knowable things. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, do you know how, I guess, going back to SpaceX, switching from, like, the like the grid fins on Falcon 9 to whatever they call the things on the screen? Yeah. Uh, does that just like change like your beam matrix essentially? Or, like, so that stuff's all really weird and complicated. Yeah. Basically, like the grid fin thing is because they're they're doing this in very rarefied flow, like really high up at hypersonic speeds. So the aerodynamics there are weird and not like normal. Um, in fact, they, it gets easier actually. Like hypersonic aerodynamics are surprisingly easier to model than like normal airplane things. It gets easier, but um, the the aerodynamics there are quite different from like what you're used to at sea level at normal speeds. So that's part of the deal. Also, they're mostly not, the, the grid fin stuff is when it's super high up and when it's basically ballistic before they relight the engines. Okay. Uh, they're using those to steer in the very, very thin rarefied flow. Uh, once the engines kick in, like it's basically all all gimbal, thrust gimbling. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the fins are doing much at that point. Um, there's also really weird, bizarro aerodynamics that happen, especially when you get closer to the ground. The fins are basically useless because um, what starts to happen is you get like, um, uh, the engine wash sort of causes flow reversal over the fins at various points. So literally, like you can't, like at certain times, based on where the uh, the thruster plume is going, it interacts with the fins in weird ways, and like the flow can be going in either direction of the fins. So your your effective, you know, like moment applied by the fins can change. Like it can reverse the sign on your control input, basically based on which direction the the flow is coming from. So like once you get low and you're in ground effect, basically the flow from the engine's bouncing off the ground and going back up around you. And that messes everything up. All right, let's do some stuff. These are excellent fun questions. Okay, cool. So let's see, gotta get rid of this. Okay, so um how to land a spaceship is the topic of the day. Is redundant, I guess. So this is just kind of the problem setup and like the goal. So the idea here is you want to go from some initial state so call x naught to some final 
final like goal state where you've got um some position r final with um height equals zero so like z final equals zero and you want your final velocity to be zero basically landing is z equals zero and uh soft is v equals zero basically right and that part's quite important um, and then usually what you're doing, so these are these are basically initial and terminal constraints, right? Um, and then generally speaking, what happens is uh, in the cost function, you're minimizing uh, some combination of fuel consumption which is kind of the nominal thing we're going to do, and maybe uh, depending on the scenario, uh, landing position error. So you might end up, for example, in a situation where based on fuel and initial conditions, it's actually infeasible to reach this like set goal state. You can always get to Z equals zero, you just fall in, but you maybe can't hit the, the desired X, Y position, right? And so another way of doing this, uh, and sometimes you, you set these up in like a kind of a two-stage thing where you solve a first stage problem that determines a feasible landing position. And then given that, you then solve a second stage problem that solves for the uh, the fuel optimal trajectory to get there. So yeah, you might have something like R final, you know, norm of R or final minus some R goal that you want to get to. And then um, you also have constraints in here. Uh, so in particular, thrust limits, which we'll talk about. And there can be um, various kinds of safety constraints. Um, the most obvious one being don't go under the ground, which actually happens if you, if you don't throw it in there, the like thrust optimal trajectories often do this. And so you obviously like you have that. And then another thing that, that happens, it's very common to put a, like a, um, a safety corridor kind of thing in here where you basically put a cone around the landing site that you need to stay above. So you don't do kind of like dip too low and, you know, maybe for terrain reasons, stuff like that. So that's all pretty common and pretty easy to set up. And so examples of this, we just kind of watch the videos, but um, sort of the, the NASA Curiosity was kind of the first mission to do this stuff, the sky crane thing. So the first sky crane thing was in 2012. Does anyone remember what they did before that? It's kind of nuts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So before the sky crane thing, they used to basically have these like airbags. So it would go down on the parachute and then they'd have these like inflatable airbags and they would just drop it on the ground and it would bounce and roll a couple of times and then unfold, which is kind of interesting. And basically what happened was they they started building bigger and bigger robots and they got too heavy to do that. And so then they had to do something else and then sky crane. Um, other examples, right? SpaceX, uh, Falcon 9, which we all know about, you know, and, and see on TV and stuff. And then uh, Starship, which is kind of the new one that, uh, you know, is is maybe going to work hopefully soon. Um, and then uh, also um, the more recent Mars rover, uh, Mars lander that we just watched was uh, Perseverance. And hopefully I can spell. And the big deal, the delta between curiosity and perseverance on the on the EDL side uh, is the this one did the terrain relative navigation stuff. So that was 2021. Um uh, yeah. Let's see. And I guess, yeah, we'll we'll go through kind of the high level stuff and then some of the tips and tricks. There's basically a whole bunch of tricks involved here. And like the convex thing is only one part of the stack. So to kind of like give you a taste for the what kind of the full stack looks like and the different pieces of the puzzle here. Uh, let's draw like a block diagram. So um, kind of the high level thing here, you've got a position controller, which is the part we're really gonna focus on. And um, this thing is looking at say position and velocity this thing's going to spit out the output of the position controller are acceleration commands. So this thing's basically looking at F equals MA. It's just reading about like point mass dynamics and the overall uh, acceleration vector or thrust vector. 
So the acceleration comes out of this. And then this goes into a lower level attitude controller. And that's reasoning about the, the attitude of the rocket, right? The orientation. And basically it's trying to track the desired thrust vector. Um, and the, the reason for this, um, has anyone seen stuff like this before where you have a position controller and attitude controller kind of separated running at different rates? Where have you guys seen this before? Yeah, this is kind of the standard setup on drones. It's the same thing here. It's a very common move. Uh, is anyone, you know why this is a thing? Because you want your attitude controller to be much faster? Yeah, well, essentially, yeah, you could run everything at that rate in principle, but generally speaking, yeah, the attitude dynamics are much faster and sort of those that's the unstable part. So you can run a fast attitude tracking loop and then you can run the sort of position controller at a much lower rate. And in this context, the, one of the big reasons for doing this is it turns out this position problem here, you can make it convex, in which case you can actually solve for the globally optimal trajectory. You can resolve the whole planning problem essentially online at real time rates. The attitude problem is non-convex and whatever. Um, so by doing it this way, you can have this really nice safe convex formulation of this, the overall position problem um, and run that at several Hertz, whatever you wanna do online convex MPC style. And then this attitude tracking control, by, that by doing the separation, you can, um, you can get a nice kind of solution for both separate. Whereas if you put them together, you end up with an inherently non-convex problem, which is also part of the, part of the reason for doing it. Um, so then, yeah, the attitude controller is going to spit out kind of thrust and gimbal angle commands. And then these actually go and run on the rocket. And then this whole thing gets fed back. You have some state estimator down here. Um, that's estimating your attitude. So this would be like your quaternion, your angular rates, and then also estimating out your position and velocity over here. Let's put some labels on this. So this stuff is position and velocity. This is your linear acceleration or like force, but that's this is kind of basically the units it, that it works in. Um, these are thrust and gimbal commands. Uh, and then, yeah, this is kind of attitude stuff. Cool. Uh, and then in terms of like kind of measurements and state estimation stuff. Um, there's kind of a couple different things to say there. In the kind of SpaceX case, uh, they basically can rely on GPS almost entirely, which is kind of awesome. So that stuff is basically just GPS and IMU in like an inertial filter. Um, Good filtering. And with this, you can get down to kind of meter level position accuracy. Um, and even better, um, the velocity accuracy actually out of GPS is incredibly good. You can get down to like, you know, very definitely sub centimeter per second, like probably millimeter per second level. And then, yeah, kind of like degree level attitude knowledge. And that, like, basically that's as good as you need for kind of precision landing on Earth. Um, the Mars situation is obviously much, much harder. You do not have GPS. Uh, so the way that works um, from, so uh, at, at like atmospheric interface, like while it's flying through space, you're getting navigation data from the deep space network, uh, actually the whole way to Mars. When you hit the Martian atmosphere, those uncertainties are like kilometer-ish. Once you hit the atmosphere, you lose everything. Uh, you have ionospheric blackout, big fireball, the radios don't work, you have no sensors. So in that context, you're just integrating IMU information. Um, and then as soon as you're kind of out of the fireball situation, um, 
you have a radar altimeter that starts pinging the ground to figure out how high you are, probably the most important thing. And then there's a vision system that we just talked about that's uh, once once the back shell's off and you turn the cameras on, you can start picking out landmarks. Um, that's good to about 30 meters once the vision system is kind of locked. And basically what it's doing though, is it's not trying to, there's not enough fuel and, and everything to actually steer towards a target per se. Um, you're basically just trying to avoid boulders at that point. Um, we worked, uh, actually the project we were on was a like precision entry guidance. Uh, the, the goal, so NASA's goal, if you want to put people on Mars is to try to get down to 50 meter error in the actual landing site, which is just not possible right now. Yeah. The accuracy of these groups is not that different on tools. Uh, they have, I mean, they've really well characterized these vision systems. And I think they, they kind of do once they're on the ground, know where they are. They navigate these rovers over years using basically these terrain relative techniques. Uh, I think they can also localize it from the orbiters that are up there once in a while. So I, I don't 100% know, but I, I think they they know. Like I, I did, I've i pulled these numbers from like JPL's papers and stuff. I think that's based on their characterizations. Um, yeah, so NASA wants to get this down to 50 meters. It's hard. Like I think the, the main challenge is actually the state estimation part. Part of it also is the, the, the ballistic phase where you're in fireball mode. Like uh, being able to steer that thing is kind of tricky and we're bad at it right now. Basically the Apollo era methods for this are terrible and, and need to get a lot better. Okay, cool. Uh, and then, so that's state estimation, the control loop. Which we kind of talked a little bit about. There is a kind of higher level position controller. Which is where we're gonna spend most of our time today. Um, this is using a point mass model, so just F equals MA. For the dynamics, and it's reasoning about um, kind of safety constraints, uh, thrust limits, uh, and kind of fuel consumption. All these important things. And then it's basically generating acceleration commands as the output. And this runs at uh, typically around like one hertz or a few hertz. Because uh, that's all you need, basically. Uh, and then the we, the low level controller. Is reasoning about the attitude, obviously. So it's taking these acceleration, you know, center mass acceleration commands from the high level thing. And then it's basically trying to tilt the rocket around and steer it to achieve that center of mass acceleration. Um, but it's also got other things to worry about. So it's got this attitude to worry about. Um, but also it turns out the flexible modes of the rocket are pretty important. Uh, rockets are built to be very, very lightweight, right? Um, there's some really interesting challenges here. So as a result of being like very big, like the size of a, you know, building, uh, multi-story building and being you know built out of super thin aluminum uh, you know to be super lightweight they tend to have low frequency modes in like kind of like maybe hertz to tens of hertz range um those modes are you know in the bandwidth of your controller so if you are not careful you can very easily end up in a situation where your controller is coupling into your like first or second bending mode of your rocket and just basically exciting it and you get into this positive feedback loop and you shake the rocket apart this has happened. This happened in the early days of of rockets, like in the fifties and sixties, um, until people really figured this out. So there's flexible modes. There's also other evil, terrible things that you have to worry about. Um, another big one. Turns out most of the mass of a rocket is actually fuel. Like, uh, and so fluid slosh is huge, huge, huge deal. Uh, so fluid slosh in the tanks, same thing. You um, you can basically at this pendulum mode of fuel sloshing back and forth in the tanks. And that actually changes the frequency of that slosh mode will change over time as you burn fuel down and the mass basically changes. Um, so you you also similarly need to avoid 
coupling that slosh mode into the controller and basically exciting it in a positive feedback loop and again shaking the rocket apart basically and trashing um so both of those things are a big deal that typically get dealt with in this attitude tracking controller in some way um and then this guy is generating rust and gimbal uh commands for the actual to steer the rocket nozzle basically uh to track that desired acceleration. And then this is running faster. So like maybe um, like kind of tens of tens of hertz or so. Cool. All right, any questions about that stuff? Yeah. There's a model of the engine. Uh, so that's all getting handled in this guy with a, a series of constraints that we're about to talk about. We're going to get into that. Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you during the talk about the appeal command to the actual thrust that they get. They have a different decision for that. I mean, yeah, this is at, at this level pretty well characterized. So the, the main thing, the thrust, I think, is pretty pretty knowable. Um, the big thing that's uncertain in there is that the rocket mass actually is changing constantly while you're doing this because you're burning fuel and fuel's the most of the mass. So that has to get accounted for See, in here. Yeah, and you're running feedback on this. So you're... You well, you don't measure the thrust, you measure the position and the velocity. And you adjust the thrust to hit the desired position and velocity ultimately, right? Yeah. How would they keep track of the fluids the perspective? Do they keep track of like the position? So you don't. Um this is very, very old school. So the way this actually works, um, you do a bunch of robust control, linear robust control stuff in that attitude controller. The gist is um for the flexible modes, you have you kind of know where those mode frequencies are. Um, and then for the pendulum slosh, you basically bound it. You say, okay, it's you literally you model it as a pendulum. You model it as a spherical pendulum where the length and mass uh, of the pendulum bob are determined by the, the volume of fuel in the tank. And you actually do like system ID and try to fit the 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 pendulum model to the the actual fluid slosh dynamic. And then you kind of just bound that. And what you do in the controllers, these tend to be like very old school full placement SISO type controllers, essentially what you're doing is notch filtering at the mode frequencies. So you're just taking like the first couple structural modes and you'll put a big frequency notch in your in your frequency domain control design so that it's not putting any energy into that mode. And so therefore hopefully not going to excite the, the structural modes. So did they run tests where they like actually shake the rocket and like compare and study? Yeah. Uh, so there's some insane stuff that goes down on, I, I haven't done, so I haven't worked on rockets. I work a lot on satellites. There are shaker tables the size of like, that that literally can shake a house, basically. Like um, I've seen this at Space Systems Loral in, in California. So they, they have like a giant vibration table that they put an entire uh, satellite on. These things are the size of an airliner, right? It's like the several stories tall and they shake the entire thing. Like it's wild. So and the uh, um, NASA Goddard also has some really wild test facilities where they'll like try to simulate these kind of things on hardware and stuff. So there's yeah lots of characterization stuff. I'm I'm sure most of this is coming from like CAD models and stuff. And basically, what you do is you kind of try to bound these things, and then you use robust control techniques to make sure you're covering, you know, kind of the range of possible mode frequencies and stuff like that. Yeah. Is the cable control? You're tilting the rocket nozzle. Yeah. So it's no, no. The the generally the the nozzle is actuated. There's sort of you know two doff kind of, and then you've got the the thrust that you can uh, throttle up and down as well. Yeah. So that's how that works. So let's write that stuff down. Okay. So a little little bit of rocket dynamic stuff. Um. So okay, we'll draw our little. Terrible cartoon rocket. Uh, you have a rocket nozzle down here. Got some fins. We're not really going to talk about. Um, you have maybe your CG in here somewhere. 
And then you have maybe your um, your fuel tank with your fluid slosh stuff going on. And we're going to say you've got some offset. Uh, okay, so you've got your thrust vector which is coming from your engine down here. And then you've got some moment arm, which we'll call L, from your CG to your actual you know, uh, application of your thrust vector. This thing's a rigid body, or you're going to right, approximate it as a rigid body. It's not a rigid body, right? Um, so you basically do rigid body model in most of the control stuff, and then you have all this like notch filtering stuff to handle the non-rigid, you know, flexible mode stuff. Um, okay, so the rigid body model, you've got kind of F equals MA stuff. So that looks like this. You have gravity, and then you've got kind of thrust over mass. So this is point mass dynamics, right? And then, um, so just F equals MA. Uh, and then this is not a uh, constant mass situation as we kind of talked about. So you also have to keep track of the mass uh, dynamics. And this is basically just some coefficient times your thrust. Uh, so this is fuel burn. So you solve this thing jointly, these coupled dynamics. And this is what's in the position controller. And basically, these are kind of relatively slow dynamics. Then you've got your attitude dynamics. So this is Euler's equation. We saw this with the drone stuff, right? And then the torque here is coming from like L cross T, right? It's moment arm cross with the thrust vector. Uh, these are the attitude dynamics. And um, so we've, I think we've seen this stuff in the drone context. This is the inertia matrix. And then this is the torque applied by the thruster. Uh, yeah, attitude control. So this, this is in the attitude controller, right? And this is relatively fast. Uh, some notes about this. Um, the fuel uh, can be something like 80% of the initial mass of the rocket you know, or more. And the total mass can change by a huge amount. So you have to keep track of that, that mass. Um, and then kind of similarly, you've got this fluid slosh going on, which is problematic. Uh, the real fluid slosh dynamics are like very highly nonlinear and hard to model. They depend on like the geometry of the tank walls. Turns out it even depends on the surface finish on the inside of the tank. And like, it's all this fluid stuff and boundary layers and, and terribleness. Um, so that's a mess. Um, it's also in like an accelerating reference frame, all this. It's super crazy and hard to model. Um, there's actually been lots of studies of this stuff in um, drop towers. So there are these uh, drop towers in several places around the world where people will like kind of set up tanks like this and, and drop them to get a couple seconds worth of zero gravity and like measure stuff with accelerometers and all kinds of weird things. Um, but the standard model of this in control design that gets used when you actually go to, you know, design one of these control laws is um, as a pendulum inside your rocket with some mass on it. So you might have some pendulum length and pendulum mass that you basically fit to data. And that's sort of good enough for like first order kind of stuff. Um, then we talked about the flexible mode stuff. Um, basically rockets are made to be really light. Um, as a result, they are not, not particularly stiff. And so you get low frequency bending modes. Oops. 
flexible modes change as you consume fuel? Probably, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know how much that changes, but yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly possible. Yeah, yeah, you're there. It's pretty crazy. Um, so the first bending mode is maybe like in the single digit hertz range on a big rocket. It's a few hertz. That is less than the bandwidth of your attitude controller, right? Your attitude controller is working around a lot faster than that. And so this is like smack in the middle of stuff the thruster might be doing. So you very much have to account for it. By the way, like from a controls or like dynamics perspective, the definition of rigid body is basically the first bending mode of your structure is way higher than the controller bandwidth, than the, the frequency you're operating the controller at. And therefore you can safely ignore it and treat it as a rigid body as far as the control is concerned. If that first mode is lower frequency than your controller frequency, that means the controller can very much couple to the, the flexible stuff and you have to worry about it, right? That's like the engineering rule of thumb is like how much how much faster your your uh, flexible dynamics are than your controller frequency. Uh, okay, so first mode is like kind of hurts and um, you deal with this in practice or, you know, it is typically dealt with by just adding uh, notch filters. Uh, to the attitude dynamics or to the attitude controller. Um, at the bending frequencies. Um, if you were using like an MPC controller, uh, in a similar situation, like what would you, so this is old school SISO, you know, like with Bodhi plots and stuff like that is, is typically how this is done. If you're going to do it with kind of MPC style stuff, how would you, how would you get at this? Thoughts? Really like idea, but instead of doing it, I mean, it's like getting back into the plot stuff, but instead of like modeling like the thrust at each time step, you could like make it up as a sum sideways and just ignore certain. Yeah, you could do that. Um, that's not that crazy. Um, so another, like the more vanilla way to do it though, is literally you just put it in your dynamics model. So you're going to add a couple of states. You're going to basically add modal, modal states. You'll have the modal displacement and the modal velocity. You just add those. So like a mode is another couple states. Next mode, another couple states. You have a coupling matrix, but you you basically add it to your dynamics model. And then you try to estimate it out somehow using sensors, right? Um, and then you can put a cost on it or you can put a constraint on it, right? And say, don't excite this, blah, blah, blah. So that would be the most straightforward way to do it. Um, you can also do notch filtery type tricks in in like linear systems as well. Um, there's certainly, that's an idea. If you wanted to straight up do the notch filter thing, you can actually similarly add states to the uh, dynamics that have a um, whatever filter you want, but written in the time domain, and basically like run your controls into that, and and the filtered stuff will end up in the state vector. You can you can basically you can do this in the time domain as well. You can write the filter down and augment the state with a filter if you wanted to, or you could actually model the flexible dynamics, put them in the model, and cost them or constrain them. Cool. All right. So yeah, you can still do it in like you know the stuff we've talked about as well. Um, and then lastly, aerodynamic forces, which we haven't really talked about at all. Um, these you pretty much mostly ignore uh, at this level. Um, you can basically, like if you wanted to, right at, at lower altitudes and stuff, you could put velocity constraints in the position controller. Um, to kind of make sure these are small. How do uh, velo how do uh, aerodynamic forces scale with velocity? So like v squared, right? So if velocity is small, then these are pretty small, and you can kind of ignore them most of the time. Which is same thing on drones, right? We basically model as a rigid body with thrusts and ignore the most of the aerodynamics, right? 
So kind of same story here. Um, how are you controlling velocity though? Isn't the maximum velocity just like when you're in initial state where you're moving down? Here? Probably, yeah. As soon as you turn the engines on, you're like going to slow down and stuff. So for the for the most part, when you're getting close to landing, which is where all this matters, you're not moving that fast, right? You're kind of hovering and whatever, trying to not go fast. So again, yeah, you can kind of ignore this stuff for the most part at that stage, at the power descent stage, right? Yeah. The dynamics, if you, when you said you'd add a cost, would that just be like a scale, like a really high cost? You could put like, you could do that or you could put, or you could put constraints on them in an MPC kind of setup, right? Which wouldn't be too crazy. Yeah, so you can write down a linearized model with the rigid body modes and the first few flexible modes, constrain them kind of whatever you want. So you can do it in a like model-based, you know, kind of way or the old school frequency notch filter way too. Yeah. Um, that's pretty, yeah, definitely aerodynamics are doing stuff there. So yeah, this is kind of the stuff we're talking about right now is I would, I would say is power descent. It's like that last phase where you're landing. Um, they're almost certainly doing something else for that part. Yeah. Uh, and the last thing to say about this, there's lots of model uncertainty in all of this. Um, frankly, it's kind of amazing that like very, very simple models like this kind of work at all for this kind of stuff. Um, so, but a lot of like linear robust control ideas get used in here. Um, art, yeah. Are using the attitude control loop. So kind of make sure that this thing's going to be stable under a very wide range of possible things happening. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like a lot of that kind of H infinity loop shaping type stuff is is what what is typically done in these things. The H infinity thing is, is basically about like bounded uncertainties on your like dynamics matrices and on the disturbances. I guess I'm talking more in terms of like the structure of uncertainty and how they. Um, yeah, I really don't know to be honest. Like, I don't know exactly what models he's got. I mean, this is like kind of secret sauce stuff, you know, at SpaceX that they, they don't publish or talk about. So I don't really know exactly what they're doing. Sorry. Uh, cool. Okay. So that's a bunch of background type stuff. Now we're going to get into kind of the meat of the paper, uh, and how this, this sort of like magic convex relaxation stuff works. So, um, we talked about convexity. We talked about convex optimization in here, right? And this is magic because it's global and awesome. And you can always get an answer kind of thing and you get all these nice guarantees. So what we're going to talk about right now is this idea of a convex relaxation. Who's seen this before? Anybody? A couple people? Nobody. All right. Excellent. It's new for everyone. Hooray. Um, this is a cool idea that um, if you can do it, it's kind of magic. This is a very cool trick. So in, in some situations, you might have a non-convex problem where, um, here, let's write this down for a sec. Sometimes you might have a non-convex constraint Um, typically, the idea here is you, you have an equality constraint um, that can be expressed as the boundary of some larger convex set. And I'll show you a, a very nice example of this. So like the classic example of this is if I have, say, a sphere. So I might have a um, some original set or constraint where I've got, say, let's call this S1, uh, which is, say, an equality constraint. So it's x such that, say, like norm x equals 1. So this is obviously non-convex, right? I pick two points on the circle, draw a line, and I... I get, you know, stuff that's not on the circle, but the the balls, like the disc, right? If I include the interior, that's a nice convex set, right? 
So I can like enlarge this set to include the interior. And what I'm doing there is I'm turning that equality constraint into an inequality and kind of relaxing this to include, we'll call this guy S2. So this is now, only thing I've changed, right, is instead of norm x equals one, now it's norm x less than equals to one. Uh, so this is, say, large set. Um, and fancy math notation, if you've ever seen this, we're going to say S1 is the boundary of S2. That like weird squiggly thing means boundary. Fun fact, if you care. So yeah, basically um, this idea of taking the non-convex set and like enlarging it to include the interior is called a convex relaxation. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so here's the real magic part. Sometimes if we're particularly lucky or we are particularly clever and we can set this up in our problem, you can kind of engineer a situation where uh, we'll say if the cost is nice, um, Basically, we can still provably get the answer to the original problem by solving the relaxed version. This is magic. This is pretty sweet. Can anyone think about a scenario, like a particular cost function where you get this? Not cost function. I've seen this in where you have like a integer linear program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's that's an example of this. In fact, that's it. That's exactly this. Do you know what, what's going on there? Do you know how that works? So the integer deal, how can I, I can literally play this game the way you do this is if you if you represent the integers as like are the um usually it's binary lps right so you you can represent the binary numbers as like minus one and one say and then you say um you can you can say that as like uh x squared equals one right so that's negative one and one specifically and then you can relax that into x squared less than equal to one and that includes the line segment right so that's exactly this down a dimension basically so yeah, that is an instance of this idea. Okay, so anyone have any ideas on what kind of cost functions would get me this this behavior? Um, that's maybe getting close to like what we're gonna do here. So there's a classic there's a classic cost function that does this provably. Um, So let's see, sometimes cost is nice. We can still get the answer to the original problem. Anyone have have the idea? One over null. Uh, that's a weird cost function. That's not a nice convex cost function. Um, solving the relaxed version. You're probably gonna, it, once I tell you, it's gonna be immediately obvious. So here's, an, here's a good example. If I have a linear objective, so like C transpose X subject to uh, norm X equals one. And I relax this into norm X less than equal one. Let's look at what that's doing. So norm, uh, so here's my original thing say, if I have a linear cost function, so let's draw C, let's say that's C. Um, in the case of a linear cost function, so an LP, right? What does this, can you say anything about the solutions to LPs? Where, where do they have to lie? So if I don't have any constraints, what's the answer to that problem? No. Minimize some linear function. If I ask you to minimize A times X for a scalar, what's the answer? The answer is you, drive, you can drive X to negative infinity, right? So it's, it's unbounded. So the only way a linear program has a solution is actually if it's like has a finite solution, is it on the boundary of the constraint? So linear cost functions, you have a linear program or any kind of linear cost function, the answer always lies on a constraint boundary or it's unbounded or it goes to infinity, right? So in this case, 
um, in this problem, the answer is always going to be you push in the direction minus C until you hit a constraint. So this is X star right here. So the idea here is if you have a, a linear constraint, and there's some other classes of you know cost function that do this, but linear constraints always do this for you. So it's a particularly nice example to look at. Uh, so if I write that original problem down, um, you know what the answer is. It's the point on the circle opposite the vector C, right? If I'm minimizing. And if I include the interior, it doesn't change the answer at all. It's always going to drive you to the boundary because of that linear cost function. So this is what's called a tight relaxation. If you can relax, the, if you can do this convex relaxation and include the interior, and then still, thanks to a nice cost function, provably always end up on the boundary anyway, you can solve the convex problem and get the answer to the original non-convex problem still, which is very slick. Uh, so when this happens, we call it a tight convex relaxation. OK, and there's lots and lots more tricks you can play to try to do this. In fact, there's this kind of crazy theory called Lasserre's hierarchy that basically says, like, you can pretty much take any non-convex problem and, and get a tight convex relaxation of it. It just might be infinite dimensional. So essentially, you can kind of keep adding more what are called slack variables. I can keep adding more variables to the problem and kind of growing the size of the problem and eventually find a tight relaxation. But I have I may have to make the problem like infinitely large to, before I find that. So it's not super practical, but sometimes you can get lucky. This is a nice example where you get lucky. Yeah. Can you give me a scenario when like you have something that represents like just look like a sine wave or something and what's the interior of that? Is it like false? I mean, that's a horrible non-convex. Like I'm, we're not gonna okay. touch that. That's too too nasty. Um, but yeah, the point is you can you can often get lucky. Yeah. Um, when you can't, like in if I took the same example and I had a quadratic cost function, is that can I can I make that tight? Generally, no, because the quadratic function might have an a minimum inside here that I'll get stuck in, right? And I don't want that. If it if the quadratic if you could prove that the quadratic bowl always had a minimum outside here, yeah. then it would be. But so but it's a little more subtle, right? And in the linear case, this always happens. But in more general settings, you can get into trouble, right? So be careful. Okay, so so that's this idea of convex relaxation. It's a really cool idea. Lots of crazy stuff about this. Um, in fact, there's been a lot of recent work in state estimation, trying to find global convex relaxations for fun, weird state estimation problems in robotics. Uh, Tim Barfoot's lab at, at University of Toronto has a bunch of recent papers on trying to automatically discover tight convex relaxations of interesting like state estimation problems. That's some cool stuff to check out. Yeah. Well, it's relaxation that's associated with the quality. Quality. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. In this case, yes. There's like fancier versions of this, but pretty much, yeah. It's usually taking nonlinear equalities and relaxing them into convex inequalities that are bigger sets, yeah. And the classic version is you find an inequality whose boundary is the original equality. And then you show that the, the cost function pushes you up to the boundary every time. Yeah, I mean, if it's the exterior, it's non-convex always, right? Cool. So, so this, make it, this idea makes it, this is a kind of a big idea. This is a big deal. Shows up in a lot of places. So now what we're going to do is show you how this idea is applied in the rocket soft landing problem and, and how this whole thing fits together. So let's do that, hopefully, before we run out of time. Um, so the big problem here in the rocket problem is that you've got this thrust constraint that's non-convex. And this one's a little less obvious, but I'll show you if we, yeah, I'll show you what this looks like. Okay, so basically you, you have a few different constraints here. You have a maximum thrust constraint, which is kind of obvious. And that looks like, you know, so you have some thrust vector in R3 that you can produce. And basically this one is just norm of the thrust is less than some E max. Is this convex? Everyone, yes? Yes, convex, right? This is norm is less than something. So that's like a ball, right? So that's all good. So we've got, say, ball. And you've got your E in here. Has to stay inside this norm ball, right? So that's all good. That's convex. Okay. 
The next constraint we've got is a gimbal limit, a thrust angle constraint, basically. So um, basically the way we'd write this is say like, um, if you have some uh, sort of like say n normal vector, like the, uh, say the, the, I don't know, like axis of the rocket vector, you can write this as n transpose that sort of axial vector. So n dotted into the thrust vector, uh, the normalized thrust vector, we do that, has to be less than equal to, say, some cos, cos theta max. OK, so maybe we draw a quick picture of this. Uh, so we've got some cone. We've got this n vector defined in kind of the, the middle of the cone. And then we've got our thrust vector, you know, having to lie inside the cone. Uh, I can draw like this kind of thing here. And uh, the cone angle here is your kind of theta max, right? Okay, is this convex? Ed's nodding, yes, it's a cone. We talked a lot about cones, right? Those are always convex, those are nice, but this is convex. So far, life is good. And this is looking pretty good. Here's where it gets nasty. The rock, so rockets typically can't actually be throttled very deeply. They maybe can only be throttled 10 or 20 percent, plus minus 10 or 20 percent. Um, they have a huge dead band. So I can maybe only throttle it down to 80 percent, and then it's off. I can't go below 80 percent thrust. So I have a minimum thrust constraint. So this looks like, um, so I have some T min where the norm of T has to be bigger than some T min. I also have the maximum thrust constraint that we already talked about. So you have this kind of thing, the norms bounded between a min and a max. So I draw this in 2D, it looks like this sort of thing. It looks like a donut. And I've got, you know, this is the feasible set. So in, in, in 3D, which is the real thing, it's like a spherical shell with an inner hole in it, right? So it's like this. Um, is this convex? Big no, right? Because I've got this interior hole that I can't cross. So this is bad. Okay, so here's the magic way out of this problem. And you can kind of guess where we're going with this, maybe, if you followed the the stuff so far. Okay, so new page. What we're going to do is, so this goes back to like, often the answer in these cases is to make the problem bigger by adding new variables. This is going to be one of those cases. Um, so let's add a new Slack variable. Has anyone heard that word before? Probably heard me say it. I don't know. So Slack variable is an optimization term for just adding new variables to the problem that kind of don't change the math. They're like new variables that don't change. It's a mathematically equivalent problem, but just you've added new stuff. Um, so we're going to call this based, we're following the notation of the paper. So if you go check, it, they call this big gamma. So this is a scalar. So this is our new variable that um, is equal to the thrust norm, the thrust magnitude. Okay, so, so far, um, so here's what we've got. I'm gonna write, write these down. So I'm gonna introduce this new variable with an equality constraint that just says gamma equals norm T. And then I've got the, and now I'm gonna write the other constraints in terms of this gamma. So, so far I've changed nothing about the problem. It's mathematically equivalent. I've just introduced this gamma. So that's my thrust limits. Uh, oops, switch min and max. Um, and then I've got the uh, the thrust angle thing. So this is n transpose t less than equal to uh, gamma times cos theta max. All right, so this is all mathematically equivalent so far. Does anyone see the move? Not here, but I, yeah. I like yeah, yeah. Like when you're landing in a rocket, like yeah. optimal way of doing it is a suicide one where you feel as fast as you can at the end. So 
can't you just get rid of the minimum thrust constraint and solve the problem if you're optimizing for lowest fuel? It turns out like that doesn't actually work out like for a bunch of reasons. Um, to make this practical, there's a bunch more constraints you have to add. One, so you might be right about that, but the trajectories that generates go through the ground and come back up. So you have like, don't go through the ground constraints. In fact, it's standard to put in what are called glide slope constraints. So this says you have to stay above some cone on your way in so that you're never going like too low too soon, which is a common safety thing. And it turns out th those solutions are definitely not um, like kind of bang, bang flavored. They, they end up kind of flying in and kind of a, same safe way. Basically, I think because of all the safety constraints, it that ends up not being the case. And just kind of obviously, that's going to be a very brittle, scary, unsafe thing to do, right? My point was like, if that is the optimal solution, doesn't that mean you're going to be nowhere near the minimum thrust constraints anyways? It turns out not to be the case in practice. Like as soon as you add in disturbances and safety constraints and all this other stuff, you end up needing to worry about this. Um, the the big issue is I can't throttle the rocket down very far. So like. Basically, like I'm stuck with it operating between 80% and 100% no matter what. And that's that's it, right? So like there's some severe limitations on the low end on like I can't actually throttle down and fall. Once I light the engine again, which happens really high up, I cannot turn it back off. I can't go below 80%, basically, yeah. Did you somehow just like put the cone in the middle of the guy? Nope. These are sort of separate. That's not That's not exactly what happened. So what I've done so far, I've rewritten these guys just with the gamma in there in a couple spots, right? But it's so far exactly equivalent. Okay, so the, the key move, if we stare at this real quick, these are all convex. And this one is not. But what is this one? This is a boundary of a sphere, basically, right? So this is, now you see the move, yeah. So we introduce a slack, we write a completely equivalent problem with this new slack variable, and now it's clear how we can like convexify it. We're just going to take number one and play the, the inequality relaxation game. So now what we end up with is kind of one star. This is the tweak. So we're going to just take this guy and do this. And then everything else stays the same. That's a linear constraint. And then this is a nice cone constraint. Um, is the reason that number two transition to be in convex with this change in variables because we're now in like we made it resulted into like more of a 1D kind of state? Yeah, I mean, this is literally these are scalars. This is just literally a linear, it's a linear constraint bound constraint. So that's nice and legal. This is a standard comic constraint, this is legal, right? Um, this was the only bad one with the new variables, right? And then it's clear you relax that one and you're yeah. good to go. But before the new variables, it was the team in. And... Yeah, before the new variables, it was a little sketchy. Okay. Um, before the new variables, it was the donut, bad, bad spherical shell donut situation. So in this context, like going back to this idea of this Lacerre's hierarchy thing, this is not exactly that, but like the idea of like often the, the way to get to these kind of results is to introduce more variables and grow the dimension. And then in the higher dimensional problem, the relaxation becomes clear. Um, there's a general story there, which this Lacerre's hierarchy thing, the, the gist of this is any smooth non-convex problem ultimately can be, with slack variable tricks, can be reduced to a non-convex QCQP, non-convex quadratically constrained quadratic program. That's basically a Taylor expansion argument. It's saying that like, if I have, some if I have any polynomial nonlinearity, I can take the, I can introduce lots more variables. So say I have like, I don't know, x cubed equals something. I can introduce a new variable for x squared and a new variable for x cubed, right? And I, now I can write in terms of those new variables, I can write the polynomial as a linear function of the new variables subject to a bunch of non-convex quadratic constraints. Then I can relax those like this. So like you can kind of take any polynomial nonlinear problem, introduce a bunch of new 
Slack variables that are just squares of other variables. So I can go to high, however high polynomial order I want that way. And then it's linear in those variables. And then I just have these quadratic equality constraints that I can then relax. So that's kind of the gist of the Lasserre's hierarchy trick for general, you blow the problem dimension up, then you can relax. Okay, so this is cool. We didn't prove that this is tight. Um, I'm not going to, uh, but check out the paper for that. Basically, the paper, there's a few routes to doing this. Um, the problem they deal with in the paper, there's sort of two versions. There's a minimize landing error version for if the problem's infeasible and you can't get to the desired landing site. And then there's a minimum fuel version um, that's basically minimizing like effectively the sum of gamma over time, which is a linear cons linear cost, right? So that one's kind of obvious. But basically, the paper actually takes a, a little bit more roundabout way to the than we did here um, and proves that this relaxation is convex using Pontryagin's minimum principle or maximum principle, whichever way you like it, like that we did way back in the beginning of class. So they kind of do it in continuous time. Uh, but yeah, an easy route to this is basically arguing that if you minimize fuel, that's basically minimizing the integral of gamma, which is the thrust here. And so that's basically a linear cost. It's just sum over, if you have gamma sub k for all time, it's literally sum of all the gammas. That's a it's you know vector of ones dotted into gamma. If you have the time history, so that's a linear cost function, right? And so based on everything we've seen so far, hand wavy. That's essentially what's going on. It's a linear cost if you minimize fuel consumption, and then you're guaranteed to have a solution on the boundary. And it's it's not too hard to kind of hand wavy believe that this ends up being tight. But check the paper for the the Pontryagin version of that proof. Yeah. So the does the cost function have to be completely linear or just linear with respect to slack? Uh, if you want to have like class function on like your goal and your like actual trajectory. So these are all constrained though through the dynamics and stuff. So it's a little more complicated. Like here, right, there, there's extra, there's a ton more constraints in here, right? So yes, but basically what this amounts to is a linear cost on your actions. And we don't really have any state cost in here. Um, instead, we have a terminal constraint. So it's saying you must get to the goal. There's an equality constraint saying you have to get to the goal. And you're going to do that subject to minimizing fuel, which is a linear, basically a linear cost on the use, right? And so it, it turns out this works out. There's a I'm giving you a bit of a hand wavy version of the story here. So in, in general, a linear cost does the job. Here, it's a little more subtle because, yeah, you're, you're not costing everything, right? But because of the dynamics constraints, et cetera, it turns out it works out in this case. And the proof is in the paper, they do it via Pontryagin and prove that it's tight. But yeah, in, in the general setting, it can be a little more complicated. It's just so have, the linear case is easy to see and easy to understand, which is why I showed it to you and you can kind of draw it and see. Um, it doesn't have to be linear. Like I kind of hand wavy told you, you know, if you have a quadratic, as long as that bowl minimum is outside the interior, that kind of works too. But you'd have to prove that to be the case, right? So it's, it's a little subtle. Um, you can, you know, in general, it can be hard to prove that it's tight. Um, often you, there's a lot of problems, by the way, where you do this relaxation, particularly mixed integer stuff. You can find relaxations that are tight sometimes or tight most of the times. And so sometimes that's okay. Like sometimes you might have a really hard problem where you find a relaxation that's tight, like as in gives you the original solution, like say 95% of the time and then 5% of the time, depending on the details of the problem fails, right? Sometimes that's okay. And sometimes you're willing to live with that. So it's, I don't know, it's, this is a big kind of area. There's a lot, lot of stuff in this space. Other recent works, I mentioned the Tim Barfoot stuff in state estimation. There's some really awesome other recent work on convex relaxations for robot manipulation uh, from Russ Tedrick's group. They have this recent work on called graphs of convex sets. That's also really cool where they figure out convex relaxations for really complicated gnarly manipulation problems with obstacles and, you know, by manual arms, not hitting each other and stuff horrendously non-convex and they they figured out like a really nuts way of basically posing this as a convex problem through some really crazy relaxation techniques it's pretty wild it's basically a mixed integer formulation that they relax all, all of the stuff you you mentioned uh, which is pretty intense and that it turns out is not tight all the time but they have like empirical you know results showing it's tight like 90 plus percent of the time 
So I don't know. There's it's a big there's a big area here. There's lots of sort of subtlety and details and messiness. Um, so I don't know. It's hard to give general answers. The linear case kind of is a is a nice clean one, but there's many many more instances of this where it's not linear and you can still get tightness results. I don't know. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. I think. Who's you? Yeah. So what do you judge difference between tight and like not tight or loose or that? Tight means you get the answer to the original problem you originally cared about. Tight means you get the answer to the original non-convex problem by solving the convex relaxation. So we would always want tight, right? Yeah. In edit, uh, loose relaxation will work. I mean, you're not getting the answer to the original problem then, which is usually bad. Like, you don't want that. But is, is that air better than the air you might get from linearizing or doing other textures? It totally depends, right? Uh, it's hard to say. There's no, I think, general story there. Yeah. Um, so geometrically, going back to the simple case where we draw the uh, the circle yeah. and then like the, the, linear, uh, the linear cost, um, like I can see we should prove that we can apply the tight relaxation only if this like uh, cost function is penetrating on both sides of the boundary, right? It's basically saying the cost function is always going to push you up to the boundary. So the, the idea here is you had some non-convex constraint that was a, it turned out was the boundary of a convex set. So then you relax it to include the interior of that set. So now it's convex. Uh, but you might land, the, the optimum might be somewhere in the middle, which is not a solution to the original problem, right? But if you have the right kind of cost function such that it's guaranteed to always push you up to the boundary, then you do get the answer to the original problem still. Which is what the proof of the paper is actually about. Yeah, and the proof of the paper is this relaxation and then proving it's tight. Yeah. So I showed you the relaxation. I didn't prove it's tight. Hand wavily, it's basically a linear cost function. So it's it's basically a, a higher dimensional, trickier version of this. I'm giving you the hand wavy version. Which is why, like, if I see it's the bound, like with maximum and minimum, that there might be a chance that it's actually landing in the interior. So Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, what I'm telling I didn't write you down the cost function they used here, though. I'm just writing the constraints. But I'm telling you what the cost function was, was basically min over gamma, which is linear. Yeah. So it's basically something that's you know going to be unbounded unless it hits a constraint boundary so you're guaranteed to have the solution lie on the boundary yeah yeah this is a little bit Um, well, if, I mean, if the constraint's non-convex, like putting a penalty on it doesn't make it, you know, if it's a non-convex function, making some penalty on it and throwing into the cost function the cost function is probably going to be non-convex then, right? You know what I'm saying? So that doesn't necessarily help you. But not a bad, you know, initial idea. Yeah. So they have accurate GPS when they're landing these things, like right next to the pad? Yeah. Like, am I remembering the video correctly where it loses, like, uh, the stream, like, it's, like, uh, like, can't see the screen the screen goes all blurry like the, the feed the live video sure screen. that may be the case that's a totally different thing from the gps signal right yeah, that's their matter you're right on the the pad and the second question is like the the, the boats on the water yeah, is, yeah. That, is that part of the problem too or definitely yeah yeah so i'm actually not sure what they do there but i they, they're definitely like controlling the position of that barge yeah. you know pretty tightly and the barge has gps so i actually don't know if they're like forwarding the barge's gps position to the rocket or if they're just able to control the barge position tight enough. Like basically if they can control the barge position to within a couple meters, then it basically doesn't matter, right? And then they're just trying to hit that. So, I mean, the barge has absolute GPS knowledge yeah. uh, and so does the rocket. And 
they can at least, you know, using good GPS and filtering, they can get the barge position knowledge down to that same kind of meter level. So the question there is then how how tightly can they control that with like thrusters on the barge? I don't know. I don't know what they actually do. And I'm I'm obviously this is all going to be limited also by like weather yeah. conditions and stuff. Do you think they're jointly solving the barge like as a stage in this thing? Too? I kind of doubt it because there's too much sketchiness in the communication links there. And so I, I kind of my guess is that they're just trying to tightly control the barge position on the barge, keep it within a couple meters, and then the rocket's just going for for that position. They have to know where the rocket is headed, right? Like yeah, I mean, so they agree on a point, you know. Okay. The rocket's shooting for that point. The barge is trying to keep that, you know, point. And I, I'm guessing that's what they're doing because the, the the idea of like linking those guys with a yeah. with a radio link and and depending on that critically seems seems sketchier than, but I don't know. That's pure speculation. All right, guys. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. That's just a pure bound constraint. Right? It's a linear constraint. That's totally fine. That seems like the bone of it. This is a scalar. Right? So this on its own, if you just like lower down, that's a box constraint, right? I don't care. It's constraining to be in some interval. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't there someone else that scaled when we did normal T and then put them in T max? Yeah, but T wasn't. T was not a scalar. So if I draw the picture in terms of T, that's the donut, right? Mm -hmm. But in terms of gamma as a scalar, that's just line segment, right? So this that's the trick of introducing the extra variable makes it nicer. I don't know if that, that seems unsatisfying somehow. But I think I need to explain something more about it. Yeah, so I mean, the, you can think of it as like, if I have, say I have X and I've, you know, two, it's 2D, right? X1, X2, so right? Norm of X like this, it's this picture in 2D, right? Yeah. What I did was up the dimension. So I added an X3. I have an equality constraint that says X3 equals norm X1, X2, blah, blah, blah. So in terms of the X3 variable, just X3, it's the line segment picture in that dimension, right? So I've increased the dimensionality of the problem. And now the constraints reshape a little bit and I, I get to do this trick. It's a little tricky. In the paper, they actually try to like draw the four dimensional geometry in some way. And it's a little hard to understand. My explanation is quite different from the paper. I tried to like make it, this is the way I think about it and the way I think is clear. The paper explains it a different way. So you might want to check the paper out. I think the paper way is harder to understand because they're trying to like draw four dimensional cones and stuff and some cross sections or something. It's a little crazy for me.